Hey, welcome everybody. I want to introduce to you a rock star that I've known for my entire life and she's been amazing ever since I've known her. Uh, this is Beverly Mestas and she and I grew up in San Luis together. Um, I think you're a year ahead of me in high school, right? Yes, correct. And so I will let her tell her a little, tell us a little bit more about herself. Thank you, Kimberly. Uh, excited to be part of this project. When you first called me last week and told me about it, I, I was just blown away with what a great idea it is and uh, what a need. And just very thankful for the opportunity to be able to to participate. And thank you for again for thinking of me um, to be part of it. So as Kimberly said, my name is Beverly Mastas. I originate from the San Luis Valley. Matter of fact, I was born in Alamosa, and uh, except for a couple of years when I was a toddler, I grew up in, in San Luis, and more specifically in Los, Los Fuertes. Um, my parents still live in Los Fuertes. They also uh, originate from San Luis. My uh, my mother grew up in, in Cuba, there in San Luis, and my dad grew up in Los Fuertes. <laughs> Cuba grew up in Los Fuertes, as a matter of fact, in the home where uh, my parents uh, currently reside and have resided for, for over 45 uh, years. Wow. Well, let me clarify something. This is not just Beverly Mestas. This is Dr. Beverly Mestas, who received her PhD several years ago. So tell me a little bit more about that. Um, is that what you always wanted to do? Ironically, I knew since I was in third grade that I wanted to be a teacher. Nice. I had uh, some rock star teachers in my primary years. It was Kathy Serna, Marie Gomez, among others, and, and uh, Miss Betty Boland. I don't know if you remember Miss Boland, but she was uh, one of my teachers. And I just, I knew it. I knew I wanted to work with kids. I knew I wanted to go into education, uh, finished high school. Uh, knowing that I wanted to, to become a teacher, went to, to Adams State and pursued a, pursued a bachelor's degree in, in liberal arts, uh, minors in science and in, in English and, and language arts. Uh, and then I began my, my teaching career. A couple of years down the road, I decided to go ahead and uh, look at my master's degree, pursued a master's degree in elementary education and uh, started thinking, well, you know what, maybe I should try out administration. So I actually went back for post uh, master's degree work and finished an administrative program again through Adams State University. Um, and at that point, began a, began a career many, many years ago in, in administration. Uh, down the road, uh, most recently in 2016, I completed the PhD program in educational leadership through North Central um, University. So very, very proud of that accomplishment. Oh, I'm so very proud of you too. It's so amazing. It's, uh, <laughs> Thank you. A ton of work. I have several friends that have been through um, their PhDs and I know that it's, um, it can take a long time and it's very trying. And, um, you know, so I, I just uh, commend you for your hard work admirable and inspiring <laughs> thank you so yes. tell me a little bit about uh, your uh, PhD I did my dissertation on the impact of teacher and adult relationships on student performance and how kids how it impacts specifically at-risk students mm. um, and focusing on again the impact that we as educators have on the students that that we work with. Hey, tell me some of your results. What did you find out? So, um, took a look and, and really, you know, my results didn't show the strongest relationship from my specific project, but through the research that I conducted, um, I saw that there is a significant impact. As a matter of fact, as, as an educator myself now, I believe wholeheartedly that we impact kids every day. I mean, look at, look at me. I had amazing teachers that I believe led me into the education field. I had people along the way that supported me, that believed in me, that helped me get to where I am today. And I'm, and I'm speaking educators that helped me get here. So we truly, you know, those of us in our profession, we truly impact lives, absolutely. Um, I believe that every day and, and try to emphasize it with those that I work with all, all the time. 
I absolutely agree. Uh, my One of my questions is, you know, Miss Gomez, um, Miss Serna, those are two of my favorite teachers as well, and I definitely remember Miss Bolin. So what was it about their teaching style or who they were as people that inspired you, that made you say, yes, this is what I want to do? Well, they, they loved their students. They cared for us, they nurtured us, um, made me feel loved, made me feel cared for. Um, and I think at that early of an age helped me to understand the impact that I could that I could have on others you know positive reinforcement absolutely making me at an early age understand that I can do this and then having that belief in me that I can do whatever I wanted to do um, and just that nurturing caring love you know love and and I absolutely had that support I have I have an amazing family but the reality is with a lot of kids, they don't have that support at home. They, they don't. So as educators, our role is even compounded even more because kids rely on us for that. We need to, to instill that in kids to help them build that, to be, to be there for them. Was there one thing that you remember, maybe one piece of advice that you heard them say or one kind of, I don't know, statement that you heard them say that kind of impacted you? Um, I don't know if a specific statement, but definitely the feeling that I can do whatever I wanted to do. I think, um, again, not through a specific statement, but through belief that I, I had leadership, quality leadership potential. Mm -hmm. um, and just, again, remembering that s since third grade, I mean, I, ironically, when I think back, I think of, you know, becoming a class officer in the third grade <laughs> and yeah. just saying, yeah, you, you have that, that potential. Yeah, yeah, I totally remember that from those teachers. And I had Miss Serna in kindergarten, and then oh. again in fifth grade. Um, and so she's definitely one of my, you know, biggest influencers. And uh, Miss Gomez was such a sweetheart, so nice, and yes. yeah, yeah. And I, and the, the sense of, uh, you know, that you could do anything, I think, was one of those things that they did instill in us. And I, I appreciate that for sure. Um, so tell me a little bit about your work now. What is it that you're, uh, what is your title and what, what kind of work do you do now? Are you teaching in the classroom or how, how are you impacting education? So right now I'm, I'm an administrator. My title is, is principal, but what I do is I oversee alternative education for, for my district. So alternative education comes in a number of fashion. I work with students um, through online education I work with students through alternative education, whether it's students that have anxiety needs, students that have medical needs, uh, students that have faced um, trouble with the school or with the judicial system. So again, they're all alternative education programs. Um, I oversee the home hospital students for our district. Um, and most recently, we established a, a behavior program at the middle school students at the middle school level for students that have significant significant needs. So again, just a variety of, I work with a variety of students that have, I would say a little bit more um, unique educational needs and really helping to determine what, what those needs look like. Uh, right now, at, at the end of this year, we had close to 300 kids in the program and literally uh, what that looks like is 300 individualized programs and it's uh, it's it's a challenging job but it's a, a very very rewarding job absolutely yeah i can imagine and i can imagine just how much gratitude there is in those families and those kids for all the work that you're doing it's awesome yeah absolutely so i'm i'm curious um about your journey through college um i know most of your your college experience was at adam state and um i wonder uh because Adam State is in the Valley, if it was a different experience for you, if you experienced any kind of culture shock, or what was what was that experience like, and how was it different from, did you actually go to Arizona to get your PhD, or was it something that you did online, or sort of a hybrid? So kind of walk me through your college journey. Okay, so um, go back, high school, high school years again, I knew I wanted to be a teacher. Um, looked at a couple of different options through throughout Colorado primarily I didn't really look beyond Colorado but throughout Colorado and really just settled in on Adam State the, the financial package that they presented to me was couldn't be beat quite frankly and I knew that they had a strong program 
went in, decided to, to live in the dorms. Um, and as you said, Adam State is right there in Alamosa. It's in the valley. You would not think that there would be culture shock, but there absolutely was culture shock. Uh, grew up in San Luis. Knew my little community, was very comfortable in my little community, but again, went to Adam State and um, people from all over the United States, people from other countries, and, and you know, really had to go through the process of how I identify myself. You know, was I Spanish, which is what I grew up calling myself? Was I Mexican? Was I, you know, at one point was I, I, I don't even remember what other countries I was asked I, I was from, <laughs> but a number, but just really having to, to, um, to self-identify, and I, I would say the freshman year wasn't as challenging because I went with a lot of my peers, a lot of people that I went to school with throughout the valley. So I had a lot of friends, again, a lot of friends that I grew up with. But as I proceeded through the years, um, unfortunately, a lot of them didn't continue that journey with me. Mm -hmm. I found myself with very, very few of us. So again, just really trying to find that battle, you know, that battle of where, where do I fit in? But, you know, I really, honestly, I think I really latched on to the Upward Bound program at Adams State. Mike Garcia uh, was, he took me under his wing. He helped me to, to find a place where I fit, gave me job opportunities. Um, again, just really helped me find a place where I belong. And I think being able to attach myself to the TRIO programs helped me to, to finish my bachelor's degree, absolutely. That's great, yeah. And then, you know, as I proceeded through, through my other programs, um, both my master's and my doctorate, they were both hybrid programs, some online, some face-to-face. -face. Um, but at that point, my career, my job was, was the primary thing I was doing. Those were more secondary, so it wasn't really a, a process of immersing myself in the environment. It was more like I work and then I go to school on the side. Mm -hmm. So I was able to to complete them that way. Very, very challenging. The hybrid can be very challenging when you're not in there fully, but I was able to uh, to find a way to, to make it work. Again, focusing and, and really relying on help from, from family and friends. And it's yeah. not a, a journey, especially the doctoral journey, it's not a journey that you can go through on your own. Absolutely right. not. You definitely need a lot of support, a lot of help, especially as someone that, you know, I, I had young kids at the time, so I really needed, really needed help with that. So tell me a little bit more about that. What is that journey like going through your dissertation? Um, did you have an idea of what you wanted to study already? Um, or was it something that sort of came along as you went through the courses? Um, and what, when you say that you needed support, what, or what, what kinds of things did you need support for? Um, I went in basically knowing what, what I wanted to pursue. I was pretty um, confident in, in the area that I, I wanted to move forward in, you know, which is educational, educational leadership. Um, so that, that made the process a lot easier. I knew what I wanted and just, just move forward with that. You know, you go through the process where you have to take all of your, all of your classes basically like um, prerequisites, I guess, which is, was pretty pretty demanding in and of itself. I went year round, uh, 12 months. I would have classes, I'd have uh, one class at a time. I would take a, a break in between. I, I don't recall exactly. I think the breaks were anywhere between one and three weeks and then I would roll right into the second week um, or into the, the next course, I'm sorry. Um, and then once you complete all the coursework, you go into uh, your comps. Mm. which is, is, is pretty rough, pretty scary, but I was able to get through comps on, on one try, thankfully. <laughs> and then you work, yes, then you move into your, your dissert dissertation work. But again, I went year round, um, you know, whether that's Christmas break, summer break, I was constantly doing schoolwork. I, um, I worked for a, a four day school district, but I would go into work on Friday mornings for my, my job, but then I would just make it a full day and I'm talking like a 12, 13 hour day where I would just spend um, the rest of my time working on, on my dissertation. Um, Saturdays, same thing. Saturdays were a lot of um, just working on my schoolwork and it, it went, it took me almost five years, four years wow. and 11 months 
to complete. And it was, again, um, full time. You know, there's times where you get frustrated. There were times where I was like, no, this is just too much. I, uh, I'm good. I don't need this. Um, but I had cheerleaders behind me that said, you've come so far. You, know, you, you can't keep up. Good. And I, I listened to that and I, I continued and, and persevered, you know, a lot of help with, with the kids, um, a lot of just knowing that there were functions and family events that I couldn't attend because I was in the middle of the comps. Uh, just again, just understanding that this was something that was important to me. It was something that took a whole lot of time. Um, it's something that I, I needed to do. And when you look at the statistics, I mean, 2% of the entire U.S. population holds a doctoral degree, 2%. And, yeah. you know, when you look at um, Latin, Latinas, that's, you know, of that 2%, 6.5%. So in the big scheme of things, 0.13 of 100% of us hold a doctoral degree. And, you know, I'm, I'm very proud to say that I'm, I'm in there with them. I mean, that's such a small number, but I, I persevered and I was able to get there. I'm so proud of you. And I'm hoping that um, any young girl or, or guy that is watching this right now and has that in mind to pursue can um, see your story and listen to your journey and say, hey, then she can do it. I can do it too. It's possible. We can increase that number. <laughs> get that percentage higher and higher and higher, right? Absolutely. Um, yeah. And then, you know, that's part of my, you know, my appreciation for, for what you're doing. You know, I, I look back and I think, and I had a lot of encouragers. I had a lot of great people behind me. But when I think of people that look like me, people that come from where I come from, we're not out there. Oh, it's hard to find, I should say. I'm not going to say we're not out there because obviously we are. It's just yeah. not, we're not easy to find. So I think that's much more, um, it shows the significance of what you're doing because we are there. Right. Yeah. Well, my baby. No, nope, <laughs> I forgot I was doing an interview. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I completely agree. Um, I think our stories are out there, and I, I know that is one of the main reasons why I wanted to do this work is to uh, really show uh, who we are um, and what we're doing. I mean, we've got lawyers and we've got um, doctors, we've got specialty doctors that are oncologists, we've got Absolutely. people that are dentists and educators. And um, and even aside from academics, we've got politicians and we've got um, musicians and artists. I mean, just a slew of, of different people that have really made a difference. and but who go below the radar and don't always get acknowledged for the work that they do and for the amazing impact that they might be having on other people, aside from their small circle of family and friends. And um, so that's one of the reasons why I really wanted to do this. Um, I'm going to backtrack a little bit. And you talked about your identity. And of course, that's something that's really near and dear to my heart because that's exactly what I went through when I was in college as well. And ironically, it was um, a lot of... Uh, um, you know, people who I thought would understand me that didn't. <laughs> you know, people that were Latino that uh, didn't understand why I peppered my English with Spanish words, um, and some other Latino people who didn't understand why I spoke Spanish the way that I did, um, and definitely didn't understand why I called myself Spanish. And you know, we're in this area, and so yeah, that's something that I, uh, I you know, that really had a huge impact on me when I was in school, and um, and one of the reasons. But I guess what spurred the book um, series that that I've been working on, um, the book that I published last year and the next two that hopefully will be out soon. <laughs> and so, I, uh, so tell me a little bit about that. And what, did you come to any conclusions? I mean, or did you come up with a an identifier that you sort of latched onto? Like, how did you navigate through all that process? Just like you said, I th it was it was difficult, um, and those that were closest to us sometimes made it. Uh, it was hard for them to understand what we were going through. You know, I, I remember coming home and talking about, well, no, I'm I'm Mexican, and my family was like, no, you're not. <laughs> we don't have any family in Mexico that that we know. I mean, uh, the Mexico as the border stands now, I, I should say. Mm -hmm. um, but I'd go to college and I'd say I'm Spanish and I would, you know, I would get some pushback there. Well, you know, no, you're Mexican and just really, really struggled with that. 
um, you know, j joined some groups there at Adam State, um, really was still uncertain how to, to identify. I, you know, I became uncomfortable, quite frankly, with the word Hispanic, and, and I really continue to be somewhat uncomfortable with that term. Um, realized that maybe I was the Mexican, that I, that I am Spanish, did, did a little bit of seeking um, along with my grandfather and tried to trace back some of my roots as well. We're able to, you know, a lot of, of generations in New Mexico and Colorado is what we found, but did find some traces back to, to Cordoba, Spain. Mm -hmm. Cordoba, Spain. Um, but again, some mestizo, some just a whole whole mixtures. As far as, as self identification, very honestly, I'm still still to this day kind of unsure how to go. I say I'm Spanish for the most part. Sometimes I say Latina, um, and those honestly are the two two terms that I primarily use to to identify myself. So I guess still kind of trying to navigate the waters in in this world yeah. as they as they may be i've i've gone to the point where i just call myself San Luisian. <laughs> you, know, so I'm <laughs> you know i think i did that for a while too i'm, I'm by it i'm by it you know i i spoke about where my my parents were from but you know i look at my grandparents mm -hmm. you know on my mom's side my grandma de herrera or my grandma garduño mm -hmm. raised in cuba Mm -hmm. you know, they're on Pietro Street. My grandpa de Herrera, um, raised on Cuba. They're on Pietro Street. They're, the houses they were raised still still stand. You look at my grandma Sanchez, uh, Mesta, she was a Sanchez, she's a Chamera. Yeah. They're from Chama. My grandpa Mestas, they're from Los Fuertes. Matter of fact, he lives where one of my primas lives now and all their homes are, are still there and all the Mestas are still there. So yeah, so, how, how did you say it, son? And Louisian. <laughs> and Louisian. I think there we go. I may have a new, a new self identifier. Well, and all, because all of those terms that you talked about just now are very unique to who we are. Cuba, I mentioned in my book, and I have no idea why that um, neighborhood is called Cuba. Uh, and that's where I grew up, right up the street from, you know, your grandparents. And so, uh, and, and my dad's family are Chameros. My mom's side is Riteño, you know. And mm -hmm. so <laughs> it's like, you know, all these little terms that nobody in the world would ever understand, you know. And so, um, and even all the little like, you know, rivalries, you know, that come with mm -hmm. that, you know, based on our past and our history and stuff. <laughs> so it's just, it's a lot of fun. And I think that's probably where um, it was college when I really, um, it just found the love for identity and um, particularly that area because it is so unique and mm -hmm. and it's where you know the my genealogy journey came from too um, and we are a mix of lots of different um, you know cultures and, and histories and uh, that's where I found out that when, as I did more research that we have Sephardic Jewish ancestry and that's where my book came from mm -hmm. too and so, you know, we're Jewish, we're um, French on my mom's side, we're uh, mm -hmm. Portuguese on my dad's side, you know, we're um, Native American. Mm -hmm. What tribal affiliation? I don't know. And that would be something that I would love to explore. So yeah, it's a very interesting uh, topic. And I think it's something that, uh, you know, that we all understand if we come from there <laughs> we all That's sort of scary. continue to navigate um, but for me it's a lot of fun and so uh yeah i just i appreciate having these conversations <laughs> and i you know and i yeah absolutely i appreciate it as well matter of fact this morning i called my mom and dad and i'm like all right let's talk through this help me understand so it's um, you know something that i've always been interested in as well maybe it's been a little bit on the back burner with me yeah but definitely something i like to delve back, back into yeah, that's awesome. So again, I'm going to backtrack a little bit going back to education. So I, I want just to kind of get a sense of what it was like this past semester, because this, you know, the unprecedented time that we're all dealing with. Uh, we talked a little bit about our quarantine here <laughs> when we first um, got on the call. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, it's been a challenge, I think, in lots of different ways for all of us. And so what has that been like for you as an educator um, throughout the spring? And um, just give me your thoughts on the fall and you know what um, in an ideal world that would look like from your perspective well education uh, and being an educator this past semester I must say was extremely extremely challenging 
it was it was quick. We had to make some quick decisions, and you know, when the decision came that we would not be returning to our buildings, it was uh, a lot of conversations, a lot of planning. You know, how can we continue to meet the educational um, and other needs of our students remotely? I think for the most part. We looked at, at online learning, we looked at e-learning, and that seems to be primarily what we did, but we also needed to make specific steps to ensure that those kids that, didn't, that don't have access to technology, that don't have access to internet computers, that they weren't left behind in this process as well. Um, so, you know, for, for my district, we did all that we can. We, we provided workbooks for those that didn't have the appropriate resource for the e-learning. Um, we provided laptops for some at the, the secondary level. We provided hotspots for kids in order to help them through this barrier. So we really did do everything that we could to help meet the, the needs of kids. Um, for most learners, what we found we had to do is really just focus on the reinforcement of skills and practice. We weren't quite set up, especially with the time frame that we were giving, to continue with direct instruction, with teaching new concepts. But what we could do was, again, um, give them the practice um, to continue. Just give them the practice to continue learning. As you know, as I was telling my, as I was telling my kids to make sure your brains uh, don't forget. Um, so that was. That was part of what we had to do. We also, you know, I was, I'm part of a school where we have a high school graduation. Uh, and that was, that was tough because we really wanted to honor the families and the parents. We know, I mean, coming from San Luis, we know how big a deal graduation is. Um, it's huge, huge. Um, so telling families and parents that they couldn't attend, that was tough. That was tough. So. What we, we did is we had initially made arrangements to graduate by appointment, uh, you know, so so the students can graduate with a select number of family and friends. So we would actually had that planned um, for Wednesday, June 10th, and on the 8th, two days, two days before, the governor eased up on his restrictions on Monday and said it might be a possibility. This is Monday morning. My graduation is uh, Tuesday, I mean Wednesday morning. So governor says this, but we still have to work with the health department and get their, um, their okay. So kind of went into initial planning um, Tuesday morning, about 11 o'clock, got the thumbs up from our local health department. My graduation was Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. So literally in less than 24 hours, we planned an entire graduation ceremony. So it was, it was dedication, it was flexibility, it was hard work, um, but we, we did it. And, and quite frankly, we had a pretty, pretty remarkable graduation. I believe we were the first graduation in the state of Colorado that allowed for um, family and friends to come, in limited numbers to come and see um, the graduates receive their diplomas. So that was, that was pretty remarkable, again, in, in such a short time frame. Yeah, that's amazing. Oh my gosh. That was a lot of teamwork, I'm sure. A lot of blood, sweat, and tears to try to pull that off. That's incredible. Absolutely. And yeah. it, like I said, it was a, a pretty remarkable ceremony. So so as we look towards the fall, we have a lot of options on the table. What I a lot of things to work through. You know, we continue to monitor the governor's guidance, uh, the health department's requirements. What I can say for this upcoming semester is that education as we know it will not look the same um, and I you know I can't say exactly what it's going to look like but I know things that we that we're talking about include face shields for teachers masks for students and staff social distancing cleanliness you know, how many kids can we fit in the classroom? We can't have the, you know, the 25, 30 kids in, in most rooms because of, of the size. You know, what do we do for students at the, at the primary level? So still a lot of things to be determined. 
you know, I know that I continue to sit in meetings. As a matter of fact, here in the next half hour, I have a meeting where we're going to, you know, roll out some of that, you know, some some of those things that we haven't that we're going to put into place. What I can say is that safety first, first and for foremost, we want to look out for the well-being of our students and our staff. Um, you know, flexibility. Uh, we have parents that don't want their kids in school at all. So looking at what kind of offerings we can have available for parents to continue to educate their kids and not have to send them to a brick and mortar building. Um, we believe there may be an increase in kids seeking to do complete on online learning. So again, do we offer that through traditional schools? Do we offer it through the online schools? What, you know, what does that look like? Um, what do blended programs look like? So I think there's gonna be a lot more reliance on, on the e-learning components. Um, I believe we'll have kids in schools as much as we can or to the extent that we can given the confines that have been set, set for us but i work with outstanding educators all the way from teachers to administrators and you know i believe that regardless of what is, is set forth that they're going to do their best they're going to work their hardest um, to give our kids the best education that they can within you know within our restrictions I ask that that families, that students, that they they bear with us. You know that they exercise patience and understanding as we as we navigate these uncharted territories. And you know, and we're going through it too. I have an upcoming first grader and an upcoming sixth grader, and I I don't know what education is going to look like for them. Um, and you know, and how do I do that? How do we do that as working parents, kids in school part time, full time? So there's still a lot to a lot to be determined, but but again, bottom line is education is going to be different going into this fall semester. Yeah, my uh, principal in the spring called it uh, flying a plane while you're still constructing it. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's it. And I think that's an amazing an analogy to, you know, to really describe what's happening here and um, and all of the variables. I mean, everything that you just talked about, there's so many different layers. There's so, it's so complex um, and so many things to consider. Um, and, you know, we all have our work out, cut out for us as teachers, as administrators, you know, as families, working families. And so um, I really just applaud all the efforts and all the work that you're doing. And, and I know I've always known you to be the type of person that, you know, once you decide what you want to do, you figure out a way and you get it done and so I know that um, the people that you're working with are very blessed to have you there um, and so I'm um, uh, you know just with you and thought and prayer you know just to you know, so that everything goes well for you out there and your families and uh, you know hoping the same for us out here <laughs> absolutely absolutely it's a tough tough time to be um, be working through but I know you know it's, I keep thinking about 1918 and knowing that people have been through this before and we have different technology now um, we have you know lots of different things that they didn't have 100 years ago and I think you know we have to consider ourselves blessed in that sense and get creative you know so and we will we'll continue to do so and give it everything we have to fight the best again the best learning opportunities for kids and you know, I'm trying to take care of them in other ways in other ways as well yeah well thank you so much it's so, so great to catch up with you and to get your journey your story and to put it out there for people to be inspired by so thank you so oh, much again you. for doing this yep. i appreciate the opportunity kimberly thank you so much i think it's a, an absolutely great project that you that you've got going on thank you appreciate that so you have a great day we'll talk to you, you too soon. <laughs> take okay, care take care bye-bye <laughs>
and successful in the SLV series. Stay tuned for more.